And so I just want to encourage you guys and thank you for what you're doing all over okay. the world and for letting me be a small part of color. Mm -hmm. I joked that I came here to be the woman I was always created to be. <laughs> <laughs> Hello friends, welcome to Combos with me, Kathy Clark. Gary and I are the lead pastors at Hillsong Church in the UK, and I'm so happy to have you join us in the conversation today. We started Convos as a podcast, which you can find on iTunes or our Hillsong London website, but we thought it'd be fun to invite you into the room. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this raw, much less edited version of Convos with Kathy. Well, today it's a massive welcome because we've got Erwin McManus here with us and I'm really excited, Erwin, to be able to be chatting with you and having a conversation with you today. I'm so honored to be here with you. And, and it's kind of beautiful. We have the music in the background. We are in the middle of color and uh, exactly. just experiencing how God is moving in people's lives. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a great background. Yep. So if anyone can hear the noise in the background. It's not it's noise. <laughs> <laughs> it's worship. <laughs> yeah, we haven't forgotten to turn off something in this yeah. little room. We are actually just sitting in a um, in a dressing room, mm -hmm. backstage of color, and um, the session is just finishing mm. in there. But you're a fabulous friend to Hillsong, the mm. whole global family for Hillsong. Well, really. I love all of you guys so much. And, um, and we've sort of certainly embraced you and adopted you into the, the colour sisterhood as well now. You That's spoken, new. You've spoken in Sydney I for colour. I did, color. yes. And we're really, really privileged to have been able to have you now join us in, um, in London for, for colour as well. Well, um, I'm honoured, but I want to know why did I get a text from Gary inviting me, not from you? Oh. Because I just can't believe for a minute that Gary's in charge of this. I think it has to be you. Okay, well, <laughs> you know what? If, if you're looking, it does say girl boss, but... I'm not sure whether it's so much girl boss in this house. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Maybe it's just boy boss in this house. <laughs> no, no, it's beautiful. It's all right. Brian texted me first from Sydney too. You got a text too. from Brian. Yeah. And you got a text from Gary. And Bobby and I are right in there. We were very excited when we heard that you were able to be able to join. I was shocked and honored. <laughs> Why were you shocked? I just wasn't expecting to be invited to speak at Color. <laughs> and, uh, Have you spoken at many and, women's conferences before? I think this uh, is my first one. I think that right. I've just opened up a new um, new career choice <laughs> and a career path. I, I spoke at the Color in Sydney, and that, I think that was the first women's conference I ever spoke at. Then last week I was in Mexico, and I spoke at a business summit of all businesswomen. Okay. And then I flew from Mexico to here, to yeah. London, to speak here at Color. So I've never done any in my life, and then this summer I, I just... Uh, now I'm doing three, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Clocking them up. Yeah. And, I, you know, there are a lot of women's conferences around the world, so you just could have opened up a whole new door. <laughs> well, Tanner I'll tell you Worms, what. door, however you want to look at it. It is exciting to speak to a group of people who are actually readers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think for a long time I'd, I'd see that 85% of books that were purchased are by women. Right. And, um, you know, I'm a writer, so I love people who love the, um, the art of literature, of writing, and, yeah. and so that, that actually excites me yeah. to open up a whole new audience and have people enter into a, a conversation that I, yeah. I feel really um, connected to. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So you would find yeah. that by far the majority of people who would say purchase your books would be women? No. No. That's why I'm so glad to be speaking. Oh, I see. I get you. Because I, I really haven't been introduced into, the, into that particular right. uh, tribe. and. Uh, most of my books are read by men, right? Gotcha. And because my titles are very um, intense and masculine, but they're really not masculine; they're heroic. And I think that's the mistake people m right. make. Yeah. Uh, the way of the warrior is not a masculine title; it's a heroic title. Yeah. And the last arrow is not masculine; it's heroic. And I find that, um, especially now, you see this in um, like Marvel, all the movies, and and there really is a, an emerging awareness that women are heroic. And that not only are they heroic, but we need them to lead. We need them to rise up and become everything mm -hmm. that God created them to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the last book that you've produced, you have, you're quite a prolific writer, aren't you? I, I've written 10 books. 10. So that's, yeah. that's a lot of material. It, it is. Yeah. To be producing and to be, um, to be putting into print. Mm -hmm. Your most recent one is The Way of the Warrior. That's right. And the theme of that is, because I actually like the, the, the rest yeah. of the tagline there. The is, subtitle is An Ancient Path to Inner Peace. Yes. Right. I really love that. I oh, love that you. ancient path to inner peace. 
Yeah, the publishers, it's interesting, when they got the book, they, were, they told me, we're surprised you talk about Jesus so much. And because um, I, I don't really begin my books in that sense with an agenda. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to deal with real issues in life and see where it takes me. Yeah. And I told them, I said, I couldn't write about peace without mm-hmm. running into Jesus every single time. Right. And, and so the book really is, I think, like beautifully interwoven with the story of Jesus. But it wasn't because I was trying to subtly use the book just to talk about Jesus. It's the other way around. I was talking about inner peace, and it always led me to conversations about yeah. Jesus. I, I am curious to hear what you might have to say. Do you think it really is possible to achieve inner peace? I do. In fact, this morning I was telling my daughter, I woke up this morning reminding myself, well, I don't know if I was reminding myself or just had this overwhelming reminder yeah. of how much I've enjoyed my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are people who are depressed who have moments of happiness. Mm. And there are people who are genuinely happy who have moments of depression. I fall into that category. Yeah. In fact, if, if I've ever felt really badly at times, I've actually felt badly that I love life so much, that I enjoy life so much. Yeah. Uh, it feels unfair because I know so many people struggle for it and never attain it. Um, but I've stopped feeling guilty for loving life and just decided <laughs> to spread that as far as I can and yeah. help other people love it too. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you think it is possible to have inner peace and to experience that. What about outside Jesus? Do you think that it's possible? Um, I think that everything is on a spectrum. Yeah. And um, inner peace is not a constant, even if you know Jesus. Yeah. And and so there's, I, I think there's two extreme misunderstandings. One, if you know Jesus, you always have inner peace. That's yeah. not true. Yeah. And the other one would be, if you don't know Jesus, you can't have inner peace. Mm. And, um, but like both of them, they're, they're inner worlds of chaos and turmoil. Mm. And, and so the challenge when you try to find inner peace without Jesus is that no one can get into your soul except for you. Yeah. So you're fighting a battle all by yourself. And that's why people end up giving up and surrendering themselves to less. When you open your life to God and you invite Jesus into your life, now you have the Prince of Peace fighting for the peace inside of you. So you, you've invited the most powerful warrior that has ever existed yeah. into your inner world to fight the battle with you and for you. And I think that to me is like what's so powerful is that I don't have to fight this battle alone. So the question isn't, can you have days of peace and days of war? The question is, are you gonna fight this battle every single day of your life alone? Right. Or are you gonna, are you gonna allow the God who created you to fight it for you? Mm-hmm. I was just wondering what your take is on the whole anxiety thing because that's connected with your inner peace. It is very much. Do you think it's more prevalent now or is it just something that we are talking about more that is making us more aware of social anxiety or uh, all these many levels of anxiety? I think that's one of the um, prevailing questions right now is yeah. do we have more of this or mm. do we have more awareness of this? Mm. I actually think we have more of it. Right. And, and I think there's several reasons for that, is that uh, when we lived in a more uh, rural environment, mm. we, the world moved seasonally. It moved really slow. Mm-hmm. And so you had less turbulence on your life. Yeah. We've become a cosmopolitan world. The world is moving incredibly fast. A 10-year-old has more information about global issues than a president did 100 years ago. Yeah. So you're trying to ask a child with an undeveloped psychological uh, framework um, who doesn't have the tools to deal with terrorism and global warming and wars and uh, societal conflicts and stability and government and economics. And that child doesn't understand all that. They understand, they just feel the pressure of it all. And I think what's happening is that um, we, we have an accelerated amount of psychological pressure on us. Yeah. But we do not have an accelerated amount of resilience within us. Yeah. So our level of resilience has actually been decreasing and our level of pressure has actually increased. Okay. And I think that's what's creating anxiety, stress, panic attacks, right. and depression. So I don't personally see us being able to roll back the clock and go <laughs> back to a um a rural uh, like i grew up on a farm yeah my mum and dad still live on the farm and uh and i had quite a sort of carefree Mm -hmm. i consider quite a carefree easy young childhood didn't grow up in a christian home 
but nevertheless, it was a it was carefree and easy. Mm-hmm. We just go out and play in the paddocks and ride the horses and wow. ride the mad bikes around. Or, I want your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I don't. I don't know whether I see generally we we're becoming more and more an urbanized right. world, aren't we? So it is, is it going to be be able to wind it back and become more? more stress-free then that's the problem is that most of the solutions to the issues of anxiety depression we have are, are get away from the city get out into the country mm-hmm. go to the ranch or the farm and this is not realistic because mm-hmm. if everyone goes to the farm it's going to become the city <laughs> because, mm-hmm. and you know and so it, um we're not going to roll back time as you said we're going to have to create new strategies for higher resilience yeah to deal with the new world in which we live and if you look at technology and the mass amount of information we have. And, you know, I mean, everybody's always berating us all now, but we hold our phone every second, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's our adult pacifier, mm-hmm. you know, but the reality is that um, the flip side of it is when my kids were younger and there were no mobile phones, they didn't see me all day because I was in an office or I was in a building or I was in meetings in some other space. I mean, I, I, they'd, we'd have a fax machine they would print out all my emails and I have to go through them on a stack. <laughs> and once the, the cell phone came in, I could actually go to my son's soccer game or go to his football game and still work from there. Yeah, yeah. And so it looks like it's all downside when we go, well, look, you're working all the time, you're always connected. But on the flip side, no, before we were completely disconnected. You never saw your dad. I mean, I don't know about you, but I never saw my stepdad. He was always gone. Yeah. My mom also worked full time and I pretty much never saw her. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we had a nanny in our, in our house and from El Salvador because we're from El Salvador and, and that was a part of the custom of the culture. Uh, we were with our nannies yeah. all the time and, but we had very, very small, um, access to our parents. So I think on the upside, I'm so much more available now because of the mobility of the phone. Yeah. But on the downside, every second of my life, I have something demanding my attention. And so it's creating an unhealthy extroversion mm-hmm. where you're not taking time to go into your inner world to reflect, to pay attention to who you are and to deal with the health inside of you. And I think that's the downside. It's not that we have all these pressures around us, is that they're pulling us out when sometimes we need to actually pull ourselves in, mm-hmm. deal with the health and strength of our soul, find ourselves rest. I mean, it, neurologically, you can find that if a person takes an hour a day and disconnects from all outside activity, um, they'll their brain will actually heal faster and they will become more generative more creative more imaginative yeah Yeah. all right well we could do that (laughs) take that take that hour out i'd love it right now we've got the dog chilling here under the table and she's just looking like she's got relax and stress-free life sorted out (laughs) that's great (laughs) we should learn something from them but i you mentioned just something um just before you were preaching and you were saying that what you believe we should do more is open up the conversation about depression mm-hmm. because there are more, it is more prevalent that people feel like whether they're it's anxious, anxiousness or, or depression. And I thought about that when you mentioned it and I thought now it would take someone with a lot of vulnerability and a lot of courage to open up the conversation about depression because it's um, it's almost a bit of a, do you want to admit that? Do you want to own up to that? Do people mm-hmm. want to own up to that? Or is it a little bit of a shame thing to start going there and going, oh, I don't know if I feel depressed or what I'm going through? You suggested that it's good to open up that conversation. I think it's important to realize that depression is, does not put you in a separate category. Mm. And, and so today, I, um, you know, at the, at the opening session at Color, I basically said, if you're struggling with depression or anxiety or yeah. you know these kinds of issues, um, I want you to stand. Yeah. And I think pretty close to every woman in the room mm. stood. And so you're talking about, I don't know how many, 11,000 women standing up, declaring to each other, I'm struggling with this too. Yeah. And I think what's really important is to realize that being depressed doesn't make you different than everybody else. Yeah. Being depressed actually makes you just like everybody else. <laughs> and, wow. Okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. And so yeah. once you realize, oh, it's normative. Yeah. I'm not broken so badly I can't get healed. 
I am broken, but I'm broken in the same spectrum as every other human being. Mm -hmm. And it, sometimes, you know, when I'm in a more um, jaded kind of state of mind, mm -hmm. I talk about how depression is the luxury of the rich. Right. Because when you're poor and you're working in the coal mine, yeah. or you're working in a farm, you just get up and go to work. And I don't think you're not depressed when you're working in that coal mine. Yeah. I don't think you're not depressed when you're working at slave labor on that farm. I, I think you just get up and you go to work mm -hmm. and you take care of your family and your kids and yeah. just do what you gotta do. And I imagine in the States during the immense time of slavery, the women and men who were working the cotton fields were pretty depressed. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you're, mm. you're not free, you're, mm. you're, you're enslaved, you lose your husband and wife at the slave owner's whim, you lose your children once mm. they um, are a commodity to be sold. I think an entire culture lived with massive depression, mm. but they didn't have the luxury of mm. being depressed and staying home and not working that farm, mm. not working those fields. And so there's a sense where there's a parallel between our freedom, our affluence, right. our opportunity, and our feeling of, and our uh, paralysis, depression, anxiety, and phobias, because we actually have the luxury of depression. Okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm digesting that. As you're I know. saying that, I'm digesting that. I know, that. it's a very odd thing to say. Yeah. And, um, and, and also, like I remember years ago, I went to my mom and I asked her, because, you know, as I, I, I've gotten older, I realized I had so many opportunities that I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could become this or that. And you ever notice that if, if you grew up and your parents are actors, you just become an actor. Or, you mm -hmm. you're, you know, if, you're a parent, if your dad's a doctor, you become a doctor. If, a, if your dad's a president, you become a president. <laughs> and because once you know it's possible, it's doable for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I remember going back to my mom and saying, Mom, why didn't you, like, tell us that we could do all these different things. And she told me, she became a follower of Christ at 40. She said, before I met Jesus, my world was really small. Mm. And then I, I became a person of faith and it's like the whole world opened up to yeah. me. Okay. And I think we don't talk about that enough. And so the reason where I'm going with this is that a part of depression is that you actually know you have options for a different life. Right. And so if you think this is all there is, yeah. you actually don't experience that, this, what would psychologically be defined as depression. You're depressed, mm. but you're not sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, if I just made these different choices or I'd gone a different direction, I could have done this, mm. you, you know? Yeah. And so I, I, I feel like depression in some ways comes yeah. because we're, we actually do have options. Yeah. And, and so then what we cannot reconcile is, did we, lose the future we longed for or did someone steal it from us okay mm -hmm. and it creates this, this tension of internal turmoil mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah which is um you know i think about it that it's a day-to-day -day life it's day-to-day -day decisions and a journey because that's choices that we make that's right There's every a, day the smallest chapter in the way the warrior is i think code five and it's and um it's about taking ownership yeah. for your life and one of the things that I've seen is that people who displace responsibility, who displace blame, people who always blame other people or blame their parents, maybe you had terrible parents, uh, it has nothing to do with that. Yeah. And there are people who had worse parents who still don't blame their parents. Yeah. But when you blame the government or blame your parents or blame the church or blame the world or blame society, you actually um, move toward depression. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you take responsibility for your life, and you take ownership for your choices, you actually develop resilience. Yeah. So I always tell people, look, it may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the most difficult things in the world is to own the fact that maybe you actually are not to blame. And mm. uh, it's someone else is to blame, but someone else isn't responsible to mm. change your life. Mm. So you can't, you have no control over the life you lived or the life that was given to you. Mm. And uh, you didn't control whether your parents were alcoholics. You didn't control whether yes. your dad abandoned you. You had no control over whether you were abused. You had yeah. no control over whether you were isolated or, or emotionally deprived of love and affection. Yeah. You, you didn't have control over that. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the hardest things in the world is to go, um, life is unfair. And, and so someone needs to make this up to me. Mm -hmm. No, life is unfair. 
And now you have to decide what you're going to do with the life you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a really good question that everyone can ask themselves is, what am I in control of? That's a great question. Talk a lot about how a part of anxiety is trying to control things that are out of your control yeah. and re refusing to take control over the things that are in your control. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's yeah. a very good question. Okay, I really want to know how you got saved. You mentioned that your <laughs> mum, is that a long story? <laughs> We're yeah. running out of time. This time is going through this so fast. But um, <clears throat> you mentioned already that your mum gave her life to Jesus well, we, when she was about 40. Yeah, we, we were irreligious. Yeah. And, um, and so um, my grandmother was Roman Catholic, although I don't know if she ever said that, but she never went to Mass. But every person from El Salvador seemed like they were Roman Catholic, okay. so it was sort of like our okay. national religion. And, and my grandfather was an atheist who believed in reincarnation and taught me reincarnation. And, um, and then when my mom came and brought us to the States, I didn't know what her faith system was at all, but I remember once she brought a Buddha home and for, for a season, so in my mind we became <laughs> Buddhists. And, and then she started reading the writings of Rabbi Kishner on why bad things happen to good people. And I remember Hi. she told me she was a Jew. And, uh, but really she was describing a deist. She believed there was a God, but he was uninvolved in our lives. And she even alluded to the fact that there could not be a God with all the suffering in the world. So I had all these different views mm. informing me. And uh, by the time I was in, Sixth grade, I read every mythology book in the library. And I was really intrigued by mythologies and wondered why we created them and mm -hmm. was there truth in them. And, yeah. and, uh, and then when I skipped forward to college, I became a philosophy student and started reading everything, you know, I mean, just from Aristotle and Plato to, you know, Brooke Humes to, uh, <laughs> you know, Thoreau to, you know, just uh, Locke and Descartes. And, and I was really studying all this to try to figure out if there's any real meaning in life. And I was trying to figure out, did anyone know the answers I was looking for? So it really postured me really well to crash into Jesus. Okay. And so I'm in college and my mom calls me up and says, I'm a Christian. I have no idea what that is. I mean, <laughs> zero. But she was happy. And I was not, ir I was not irreligious or against religion. Yeah. I just was, if you believe in God, I would argue there was no God. Yeah. And if you did not believe in God, I would argue there was a God. Okay. I really didn't have a position. You're an antagonist. I, I, yeah, I, I just liked the, the, <laughs> the, the, the conflict. And uh, you know, it was a part of it for me. You know? yeah. and, and some of it was like I thought, if someone can win this argument, maybe I can figure out what's real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was hoping I would eventually lose the argument because I wanted yeah. to find myself. Yeah. You know? And so I didn't know when I went to see my mom in Florida that she had had this religious experience and... And uh, that's how I would the, would describe it then, right? Yeah. You know, and that she was going to church. And was, I didn't even know churches existed. I, I, I would have never identified a church in my life. Wow, okay. And uh, I'd never seen a Bible in my life that I could, except maybe once. And um, so I was trying to figure out what, is she yeah. in a cult? Is, you know, yeah. has she lost her mind? And then my sister started going, which I thought was a little bit odd. It was, I felt like it was brainwashing these junior high girls. and. You know, I, I didn't see everything from a, from mm -hmm. a positive filter. Mm -hmm. My brother is an atheist, and he starts going to church, and he's older than me. And I'm thinking, what a hypocrite. He's an atheist, <laughs> and he's going to church. It just seems wrong. I even confronted him. I said, you're an atheist. Yeah. What are you doing going to church? And he yeah. said, there's great volleyball and beautiful girls. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I thought, okay, <laughs> okay. okay. I, can, yeah. I, I, I can understand that motivation. <laughs> you know? So I watched them all come to faith in Jesus. So I was the only one that was not. And, uh, and it was a little confusing. Because yeah. I knew how broken my family was. I knew how immoral my family was. Yeah. And I'm like, what's the deal? Does God have any standards? Okay, you know? <laughs> so what was the deal breaker? What was the thing that broke that? Um, I kept meeting people that claimed Jesus. Yeah. That I really liked better than I liked myself. Yeah. And, uh, and even when I'd argue with them, they were not, they were really not trained and equipped to argue but they were so alive. Mm -hmm. And I kept walking away thinking, I won the argument, but I think I still lost because I'm still me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And I think they won because they're still them. And so it was really almost like an essence thing. Yeah. I wanted to be a person that I could admire. You know? And I felt okay. like there was some wholeness and some joy and genuine love and compassion. and. Um, I guess now, in retrospect, I was seeing Jesus in them, but I didn't know. Yes. You know, and well, I you thought, wouldn't have known because you didn't know Jesus. I didn't know that that would have seemed like 
really weird to me for a person to say Jesus is inside of me. I'm mm. going, it sounds like mm. possession or aliens body snatching or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of our language doesn't make sense to people who are really, yeah. you know, outside the faith. Yeah. And it didn't to me. And then my brother became a person of faith. And I remember telling him, if God accepts you, God has no standards. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand grace. Yeah. I, I thought you had to be, you had to hit a criteria. Yeah. You had to be pretty good, get to a spot. You yeah. know, if there's a God out there, he certainly has some standards, right? You know, mm-hmm. and then I finally realized that in some odd way, God has no standards. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And which meant, uh, and and I, I had this desperation inside of me, but I wouldn't let anybody see it. And um, and mm-hmm. so I flew my girlfriend in from another state to try to end my God inner conversation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and after she was with me a couple of days, I remember just sitting on the side of a street and I just, I just started weeping. And she'd never seen me cry. I was emotionless and uh, in that way. And she didn't know what to do. And the reason I was crying is I realized she couldn't feed what my soul was longing for. Mm. So I put her in a plane and sent her back. And, mm. uh, and it was then that I, um, I just, dis- I, I didn't have enough information. You know, I wish yeah. I could say it was an intellectual decision or I, I studied all these religions and boom, Jesus made the most sense. It wasn't really yeah. like that. Yeah. It was kind of a desperate act. Mm-hmm. I just said, God, if you're out there and Jesus, if you're real, I'm yeah. in. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so I, I feel like the eruption of faith came after. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I think sometimes we try to make things over technical, you know, and we don't realize that God's actually pursuing us. Yes. And yeah. he, it's almost like I gave him the slightest, smallest opening and he took it mm-hmm. and he changed me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was as incapable of denying Jesus after I gave my life to Jesus as I was incapable of understanding him before. Right. Yeah. And um, and I still remember the, the evening. I still remember the moment. Yeah. And um, and it just changed everything for me. It, it is. It's 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 just like that, isn't it? I remember going into even that point of making that decision. Okay, Jesus, if you're for real, then I'm going to take you on board. Mm-hmm. But prior to that, I could have, within minutes even, I could have said, I cannot buy this because I cannot believe that you can tell me the whole world started with Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. For some reason, that was a, a stumbling block for me. It's like, how can you tell me that <laughs> all of these people and all these cultures and races exist and it came from Adam and Eve? I just can't believe it. I remember then having that encounter that evening and we were in a church building and a church meeting, I went with friends. And then the next morning I woke up and I just, everything within my heart had just changed. I could possibly, mm. it was a, it became a possibility. Yeah, and that's a part of for me what, how I couldn't even imagine ever denying the reality of God or the reality of Jesus is that no one told me what was supposed to happen inside of me. Mm. It just happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't have any background, so no one prepped me. I didn't yeah. grow up in church, so I wasn't pre-trained, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you have an encounter with the creator of the universe and it changes you, you're just trying to catch up yeah. to understanding it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it, it you know, sure. I, did, I didn't have the information, and then I, it all started unwrapping. I was in the middle of it going, God, what in the world is happening to me? And I'm just trying to understand as fast as possible. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it, it's funny. I became a follower of Jesus. And within a few days, I tell my mom, I'm not going back to college. I'm going to go from city to city telling people about Jesus. Yeah. I had never even read the Bible. I didn't know that's what the disciples did. Okay. And okay. Uh, she got really nervous. I had to go to college right away. So she was happy I went. There's no way you need to go back. But when my mind was, people don't know. Yeah, no, that the creator no. of the universe loves them. That you know that God has stepped into human history. I, I, and I remember uh, the reason I went uh, I went from there to get my master's degree in Texas is I asked these people, "What's the furthest west I can go?" I, I wanted to go to where Christianity had not yet gone. And when I went out to California, I thought I'm going to be the first person <laughs> that goes to California that tells anyone about Jesus. You seriously <laughs> knew nothing. I knew nothing. <laughs> I was so disappointed when there were already like people who believe in Jesus out there going, "Dang it, There's churches here!" <laughs> yeah, you know. And then you know you see it everywhere. It's like when you buy a Mini Cooper, you never saw one before, but then when you buy one, yeah. you see it everywhere. Yeah. 
now that I'm a follower of Jesus, I see churches everywhere. I'm meeting, you know, Christians everywhere. I'm going, where were all these people before? Where are all these buildings before? And just be, and, but you know, on the other side is like, once you come to life, you see life everywhere. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. So I think it's fascinating that you've come from a, um, an industry that was involved with, uh, Filmmaking Mm -hmm. and fashion design. I love that. I absolutely love (laughs) that you've come from that world. But now you find yourself actually being a full-time pastor and minister and leader and church builder. Yeah, I've never been a full time anything. I'm a full, full, full time. You know, and so great. You do a bit of everything. Yeah, you know, because I would consider one of my primary careers as being a writer. Like I I see writing as an art form, and uh, and um, and it's probably the first thing looking back even in my childhood that I ever wanted to be. Yeah. So right now I'm working on a graphic novel from a mythology I created out of the Persian right. Empire. And, and uh, so I'm always writing and creating. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, um, I think I'm a storyteller and then I look for different mediums yeah. you know, to tell stories that change people's lives. And, uh, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a pastor and uh, it's, it's really weird for me to say that. Yeah. I never really felt <laughs> totally comfortable with it. And I've always worked outside of the church. So the church was never my vocation, right? You know, and so I worked as a futurist for thirty years, and a filmmaker, and a fashion designer, and and had different companies, and and so my income was always outside. Mm-hmm. So I would say that's why I say full time. You know, it's like it's full passion, right? There's no, you know, there's no such thing to me as full time because you're always doing multiple things with yeah. your life. You yeah. know, because I'm also a full time husband, but I'm yes. not always with my wife, and I'm yeah. always a full time father, but I'm not always with my kids. Yeah. So I think it's really more full heart than it is full time. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm full hearted. I'm full hearted for the church. Yeah. And I want to make a difference in the world by helping create uh, an entirely new expression of the church for this time in human history. Yeah. That's a huge passion for okay, me. Okay. So could you just describe for me Mosaic Church, which is your church that you and your wife Kim started however many years ago no, in Los almost Angeles? Almost 30 years ago. California. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Interestingly enough, one of the unique this is, is is that we're just called Mosaic. Okay. And but uh, the church around the world always adds church, and I would say that's one of like the distinguishing factors of Mosaic. Yeah. Is that the church, even the best churches, the most contemporary and the most creative churches, really are postured to have a conversation with the church with Christians. Mm-hmm. And Mosaic is really postured to have a conversation with humanity. Mm-hmm. And so we don't really divide between Christians and non-Christians. And so our language is very human. And, right. and, and it's interesting, um, even when I was in, at the Sydney Conference of Color, someone, yeah. one of the pastors came up to me and asked me, how did you learn this peculiar language? They said, we've never heard the Bible taught with the language that you're using. Mm. I said, if you break it down, it's actually just English. Mm. It, you know, I just don't... Um, use a highly Christianized language. Mm. And, um, you know, and so very little of the things I say have to be redefined for a person without Jesus. Yeah. It makes as much sense for them. I said, you know, because if you grew up in France, you speak French or, you know, Japanese, you know, if you grew up in Japan and people grew up in church, speak Christian. They just don't know they do. Yes. You, You know, it's just like for me to, if I hear you from Australia and I listen to someone from New Zealand and I listen to someone, let's say, from South Africa, I may not be able to pick up the nuances between your accents, mm. but you know when someone's from Australia, you know when they're from New Zealand, you know when they're South, South Africa, and you might even be offended if someone says, are you a Kiwi? Or, <laughs> you know, and except for Brian Wooden being a Kiwi, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and because the, the English is, is the same core language, but the, but the accent and the dialect is different. And I think one of the things that makes Mosaic really different is that our dialect is actually a unchurched dialect. So when I write my books, I write about yeah. Jesus, but I use a language that an, a person without faith would go, yeah, this makes sense to me. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, and, yes. And that's been the meticulous thing about Mosaic. Is, you know, I started, it really started in a nightclub that Prince owned in downtown yeah. LA. And, um, and that culture emanated out of that expression. Do you find then that Mosaic has created its own language? It is. It does have a very... Around uh, your Christian ease, if no. you like. No, and our language is still very, uh, it's very secular. Right. We talk about spiritual things in a secular way. Yeah. And, um, Can and, you give us an example? Um, I'm trying to think of someone. Yeah, like we had this guest speaker 
Yeah. And she's awesome. She's maybe one of my favorite Christian, you know, speakers. Yeah. And the first thing she said when she walked on the stage at Mosaic was, if you love Jesus, would you just give a shout of praise? Mm. Which you could do at Hillsong, you could do at C3, mm. you could do anywhere, mm. at any church in the world. But if you do it at Mosaic, you just alienated a huge part of the room. Right. So what you've actually said is, I'm here to talk to you if you believe. Okay. But, but those are things that for me, like, um, they, they really make me anxious. And, um, but you can't, but the, but that person and anyone in that world would think that they did it exactly right. Does that make sense? It does. And, and no matter how many times you talk to them, they can't see it. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, and, um, it's just like, I, I spoke years ago at Planet Shakers and, uh, oh my gosh, over 10 years ago in yeah. Melbourne. Yeah. And as they picked me up at the hotel and drove me to the event, they said, when you speak truth, the place will be really responsive. I said, what, what do you mean? And they said, you know, when you declare truth, the, church, the place will be really responsive and they're going to be really engaged. And I said, do you mean when I say something, everyone already believes that they'll start cheering? Mm -hmm. They go, yes. And I said, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't happen with me as much. Mm -hmm. when, when I say my most important things, the room is really more silent. They're not even sure if it's true yet. They're trying to figure out, mm. am I, is, is what he's saying right? And mm -hmm. am I allowed to believe that? And, mm -hmm. and it's later that people respond. Yeah. And I think one of the differences is that um, Mosaic is off rhythm with Christianity. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I use the metaphor of this um, whale uh, that um, is the singular whale in the world. It's the only whale that they ever found that didn't have a pod. And they call it the loneliest whale in the world. And it's because that whale... Uh, whales communicate through um, a, a sound. Yeah. And um, every other whale in the world is in like the 40th hertz. And so they can hear each other, and communicate with each other, and find each other. But this whale somehow genetically was born to only speak at 52 hertz. And so because of that, the whales can be passing each other and they never actually see or hear this yeah. whale. Yeah. And this whale is unfamiliar with all the other whales in the world because it can't hear except at 52 hertz. Mm -hmm. And Mosaic is a 52 hertz church. It It's speaks at a frequency that people without God who are searching for God hear, mm -hmm. but it sounds like the wrong frequency for Christians. Mm -hmm. Years ago, actually, a producer from Hillsong and uh, came out to LA before you had a campus there. Mm -hmm. And and my our friends from Hillsong were saying, you need to go to Mosaic, you need to go to Mosaic, you need to go to Mosaic. And, and he called and said, nah, I can't go to Mosaic, it's a cult. Oh. And they said, why would you say it's a cult? And they said, because every non-Christian I meet goes there. Right, and they said, "No, that's what makes it different," you know. <laughs> you know, and fortunately, the pastors at Hillsong knew yeah. you know, that um, we were all about Jesus and the scriptures, and but it is even the way that you you pull out the scriptures, yeah, and talk about it. Does that make sense? You yeah. know, yeah, and um, and so it it just affects all the language and everything. I tell people when you bring in a friend who doesn't believe in God, you listen differently to everything. You do. You that do. is very true. Right. When I have someone sitting beside me and I've invited them to church and they're not churchgoers, right. I am ultra sensitive to every little thing that's being said or done or the music or the volume. I, I just, you pick up on everything. Yeah, and I never stop being that person. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so in every, even in our leadership meetings, I'm always representing the person who doesn't believe. Yeah. Even last night at three in the morning here, I sent a text to a journalist from Vanity Fair. Uh, because he just was on my heart. And uh, he, I met with him for the first time last week. He came on Easter because he's doing a story, which made me nervous. Mm -hmm. And then we got coffee for two hours. And he said to me, I'm an atheist and I'm Jewish. And he goes, and my wife's even more of an atheist than me, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, um, he was, and he was asking me, you know, um, I could see people feeling it. Yeah. But I, didn't, I don't think I felt it the way they felt it. Yeah. What, what do I need to do? And, uh, and I just started talking about, you know, spirituality is like a muscle. And if you've been an atheist all your life and you haven't exercised it, mm -hmm. yeah, and it may feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you have to, I said, so keep coming back. Yeah. And then I, I sent him to a, a really beautiful experience this morning, um, Friday morning in LA. I said, I want you to experience faith in a secular environment you know, with these friends of mine. And what to me was key is like, he just kept coming back to my heart all night long. So I sent him an email and I said, you know, I know this isn't your language, but you're on my heart and I'm praying for you. Mm. And, and Yeah, uh, well, even the fact that you said on your heart. Yeah. He's a very... Different. Very, what we would say. Yeah. <laughs> Christian. Yeah. And, um, 
Yeah, and maybe like even some of the way you would use gifts, like what in a Christian environment you'd say, I have a prophetic word for you. Yeah. Like yeah. you just never hear that at Mosaic. Yeah. You, you know, but you would hear someone say, Hey, you know, I, I had this uh, I had this thought that maybe I, I yeah. wanted to share with you yeah. and and then and then might you go, I I, I I know it sounds strange, but I, I think maybe God is like telling me this and so I just want to share it with you and mm -hmm. you could figure out whether it's mm -hmm it's real for you yeah. and um we, we we tend to not use as much like god talk you, you know yeah but we were really god present yeah mm -hmm. and that, that's just mm -hmm. it and it's not right or wrong it's just different i get it's it just i different. get it i understand it yeah. to be honest i think gary challenges dan sitting here as well and i think you would agree with me dan wouldn't you that gary often challenges us uh, us mm -hmm. in things that we might say or even people that are on the platform and speaking or in seeing even mm -hmm. of what are you saying and does that person understand well your husband is probably saying? one of the most ruthless thinkers i've ever met <laughs> yes. and i mean that is an incredible compliment uh, yeah. that's why I, that's why i like i admire gary so much yeah. and i love him and and my kids know like i mean when gary sent me a text i responded probably within five seconds <laughs> yeah you know and i didn't even look at anything he said can you and i said yes uh -huh. Like, because to me, Gary's one of those people, if he asks me to do anything, I'm a yes. See, that's why Gary sent you the text about speaking here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of it is because he's such a, um, he's a brilliant thinker. He is. And he's, and he's ruthless <laughs> in his own self-examination mm -hmm. of whether he's doing things in the way that Jesus would do them in London in this time in human history. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether it's acceptable, like he's, he doesn't try to figure out and I, I probably shouldn't say this, but he doesn't try to figure out what Hillsong does. He he assumes that whatever Jesus would do is what Hillsong yes, does. Yes. And and even if it doesn't do it yet, it will. <laughs> and uh, and I, that's what I like about him is like I don't try to figure out what does Mosaic do. Yeah. I try to figure out what would Jesus do mm -hmm. in this environment, mm -hmm. in this world, and that's what Mosaic does. Yeah. So you know the culture doesn't submit to Mosaic's culture. You yeah. know Mosaic submits to um, the essence and culture that yeah. Jesus is creating in the world. Awesome. Yeah. Owen, our time has just flown by. I cannot believe it. We are well over time and we need to get you to have some lunch because there's other stuff going on as well this afternoon for, for, um, for colour. You know, when you were just speaking in there and you said that you'd just been on a holiday with your wife in Ireland. Oh, like that was a while back, yeah. And, you, and she kind of looked at you and went, I've been three days and you haven't spoken to me. But you're <laughs> thinking, I've had lots of conversations, but the only you know, right. conversations going on in your head. I'm sitting up there in my seat going, oh my gosh, I have to talk to this guy for a good 30, 40 minutes. What am I going to say? <laughs> you are surprisingly very easy to converse with. Oh, thank you so and much. And it's been really enjoyable having a conversation. You are a great storyteller. Oh, well, my daughter, um, I think, really had an opportunity to have a conversation with you last night, yes. Mariah. Yeah, I chatted with Mariah. And she goes, I met Kathy <laughs> Cook, and she is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and Mariah time. is a very tight filter. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to impress Mariah. All right. You know, okay. there's some people whose who's inner circle is like an open circle. The whole world's in their inner circle. Mariah <laughs> is one of those people with a very, very tight circle of respect. Yeah. And, um, and she was just raving about you. Yeah. And, oh, I, and, I, and I want you to know that, that I was like actually excited to do your podcast because oh, you're, you're really a brilliant thinker and you're right. thoughtful and powerful as a human being and i had this thought for color i'm gonna leave you with this oh yeah go for it my um i, I had this internal um manuscript on uh, that women are endangering uh, women are in danger of manhandling the future oh yeah mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if women lead like men they'll create the same future that men created in the past mm -hmm. and we don't need women who lead like men we need women who lead like men should have led mm. and we keep dividing between male and female mm. there were there were great men leaders in history and there have been an endless number of terrible men leaders in history mm. and just because and i because i just came from the secular event and uh, where women leaders were there and i thought the goal of the future shouldn't be to have women leaders the goal of the future should be to have great leaders yeah and to have good people lead greatly yeah and so I just want to encourage you because I think what you're doing is really important because you are thoughtful and you are intentional and um, you're the kind of leader women need to become. And I think what you're doing at Color is you're calling women not just to lead but to lead differently. Mm -hmm. 
And because I hope the future is filled with men and women who lead differently exactly. than men and women have led historically. Yeah. And so I just want to encourage you guys and thank you for what you're doing all over okay. the world and for letting me be a small part of color. Um, I joked that I came here to be the woman I was always created to be. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. We know it's precious and we really do appreciate it. Thank you it. so much, Kathy. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear from you too. Check us out on Instagram at Convos with Kathy. If you have any questions or thoughts about what we've talked about today, or even suggestions of a topic you'd like to hear about, feel free to DM us. We'd love to connect with you. Till next time, see ya.